Coast. I'm the head of the security operations practice with uh, threat intel, incident response, vulnerability management, digital forensics, and pretty much security architecture, and pretty much anything that gets thrown at me. If I haven't done it, I've probably even been meetings discussing how we should do it, or no, we shouldn't do it, it's completely stupid, right? Now, that being said, this talk has not been reviewed, not been sanctioned, other than my boss knows I'm here to do this. So this is me, I speak for no one else, hopefully no one else is speaking for me, otherwise they'll get themselves in some serious trouble. And the standard disclaimer applies, right? So to clarify this, who are you? Well, I'm assuming you're a human. This is not the sci-fi convention. And potentially you're a hiring manager, I'm looking to hire professionals, looking to pe for people to stay and grow with your team, or you're an someone who's aspiring to get into the field or get a better job in the field and you're trying to figure out how can I social my engineer myself into it better? How can I learn how my adversary, the hiring manager, what do they need, what's their interest, and how do I get in there? Because there's plenty of talks on these great tools. There's plenty of talks on what's the latest vulnerability we've been seeing. There's very few in regards to this context about the hiring manager and trying to find talent. And we need these folks, but we still beat ourselves up on both sides of the table doing horribly in regards to this area. So this takes my bit of experience in this. Also other folks that I've talked to in the community and the feedback we've gotten to go, hey, how can we do better at this? Because yeah, we're hackers, and they're going to keep portraying this. But what's in reality, we're looking for folks that the true sense of the hacker, right? How can I do this? Or how would the adversary do this, and how can I defend against it? Right? That's the mind, part of the mindset we're looking for, which is hard to find. It's hard to find people to hire. How much did you hear about this? How many companies out there are probably saying the same thing? Right? Now, because we're geek, nerds, hackers, and whatever. We're weird shits, they like to do weird things. <laughs> Talk about having that conversations with HR and recruiters inside, right? This is a social engineering exercise. This is an exercise for us as hiring managers to manage up, right? Because we have to get folks interested to apply. We have to circumnavigate those bottlenecks in HR we have to find an appropriate candidate that upper management approves of, <laughs> you know, all the way down to getting them the candidate to show up on day one and onboarded and interested and helping them grow personally and professionally so we're getting things done and we're finding the badness and putting the fires out. So I break this process down in a couple different areas that we're going to talk about today. One is setting expectations that application process as a whole, the interviews itself, closing the deal, and then perspective and expectations to close it all out. And that first one is our expectations as hiring managers. It's all glamorous, but in reality, I still don't know how they got a picture of my garage. Because there's nobody to hire. But in reality, oh, you want us to work in your corporate office out in Wichita on a six-month contract to fire, on a rotating SOX shift cycle. Oh, and you start night shift. Oh, you've not heard that term. <laughs> so there'll be a couple of those phrase drops in this talk. And Jack Daniel had it right on, okay? The jobs are shit and don't pay market rates, but yet there's nobody to hire. Along with that, Win Schwartu has this whole blog series and a couple of different talks where he starts harping on hiring the unhirable. He's spot on. And we'll talk about this a little bit more, right? So what do you want as a hiring manager? Because these job descriptions are horrible, right? There's the, the many that, oh, junior entry level, but you have to have a CISP. Not possible, not logical. 
the position descriptions all over the map. So you have folks that you're trying to figure out why you're getting these resumes because these applicants have no clue what you want, so you're just submitting them out, hopefully hoping something happens. So what do you really, really want? In reality, and no, I'm not gonna sing it, sorry. That's it, hacker karaoke later. But what do you need? What's that job entail? What really matters to your environment, to your team, to the business that you're supporting? In regards to experience, capabilities, talents, etc. And don't ask for things just because, oh, that'd be cool if they had Splunk experience. Yeah, it'd be cool. Can you afford it? Are you going to ever use Splunk? Maybe, maybe not. What really matters? Getting past HR, what level of experience you need, and that conciseness helps reduce that likelihood of alienating applicants and also getting all these applicants that have no clue what you're looking for so they're just gonna spam it out. Those certifications, those degrees, are they directly relevant to the position? Can the business afford reimbursement of that cert if they pass it within a certain amount of time? If you're gonna make a certificate or certification, a requirement for this role, in reality, you're making your competitors pay for it and you're stealing them from other people. How realistic is that? If you're not gonna pay for it, but you expect other companies to do the same. Is that position even logically possible? Here's a two years experience with not just a CISP, but ISAP and ISEP preferred. Now, scope the role, right? Is this a contractor for a short gig? Or is this a full-time employee, right? Is this a specialty role, like they're gonna be doing forensics, or they're gonna be doing incident response, or they're gonna be a malware reverse engineer type, or is this gonna be a jack of all trades, master of none? Is this, what realm or is this role intended to be working in, at least at the time that we put this position description together, and for the length of the interview cycle that we're doing? Because we know it's gonna evolve and change. Business changes, at least you hope so, right? And be careful with the vendor specific preferences because your adversary wouldn't be digging through your online position to see what tools you're using, right? OPSEC. Dedicated roles, right? Is this application versus system versus network security? Are you a vendor? Are you a developer of software or hardware? Give the applicant an understanding, at least initial understanding of what they're looking at so you can entice them to apply and then have a more serious, deep conversation with them, either on that phone, a screening call or in person, after you even do NDAs if your company makes you do that. Because there's that jack of all trades and there's that master of none. And as a hiring manager, I need to, I should be concerned about what's that career growth? What's that health and welfare of the team? Folks on my team getting burnt out. Folks in our industry making fun of us because we have a SIM admin plus incident response expert. The best one is the GRC and firewall engineer. Because <laughs> that's two totally different talents, people in my mind that I would see wanting to do that. How do you as an organization, where does this person fit within the team, right? Who do you report to? The report to IT, compliance, or legal? Yeah, we're talking about hiring here, but we're also talking about what sort of visual are we giving these applicants on how effective your team is going to be and do I want to jump into this firefight so some of these questions are a lot more strategic right and we can talk specifically about startups and you know you hire a security architect to handle all of security for a startup well that's not a replacement for a CISO there is consultants four startups that are telling them this is the approach they should do. So as hiring managers and also as applicants can uh, be wary of this.
I mean, let's talk about contractors. Let's talk about those temp to fire roles. What does that say about your company and your culture within the company and your leadership, right? Cycling through folks until there's a right fit, aka you never really hire somebody, right? All that risk is on the individual. There needs to be some risk on both sides of the table here, right? There's a difference between that hired gun that you bring in to do identity management project because you don't have the skills internally or you have so many other fires you're trying to put out and the abuse of individuals in this particular system. We know all about, I'm sure you've experienced those great phone calls and those great emails from certain recruiters and body shops overseas going, hey, what's your hourly rate and give me your resume in a word format so I can spam it out to everybody. That's helping perpetuate what is being called a contractor class, right? You have these folks that, hey, I need a gig, so they jump into a contractor role, and then that's the only thing they can get for a few roles, if not a few years, because nobody wants to hire for a permanent role because I can't afford them, they don't want a permanent role, it just excuses. And it's creating another class of unhirables like Wynn re referred to earlier, right? Many of us hacker types, many of us in the industry, we know this craziness, so we're ignoring these bottle shops and we're not even talking to them, so if you're relying on them, what's the quality and type of candidates you're even getting? And this cycle goes on. And it feeds those body shops that we all complain about, but yet hiring managers are re-leveraging them. And we could talk forever about compensation, right? Okay, we know the range, pay them what they're worth. We understand we have budget limitations, so what other things can we leverage to help with that? Because there's plenty of other things out there with a little bit of cre creativity, right? Because we want a professional development. We want some challenging work to do, some good folks to work with that we can learn from personally and professionally. Yeah, stock options, whoop de doo Free lunch, yeah. It'll probably make me sick anyway. Because I've gotten the calls from the recruiters going, dude, this is an awesome place to work. I, don't, I really don't want to see a beer cart and certainly not a freaking beer pong table. Some nice silence, maybe a place to play some headphones so I can play my electronica while I'm doing through some logs. An application with some good UX UI. Okay, now we're talking. Those are all things we need to consider as we're putting that position description together. Where's this person gonna sit? And now that we're ready to have people apply and try to find folks to apply, because preparation is key, right? Before the first calls are even made, even potentially even before that job is being posted, we need to figure out what the timing is going to be, what the things we're going to ask about, and who's going to ask about it. Because by the time we get to calling an applicant, they could have finished the process, hired, and started elsewhere before you even called them. Just because they have their processes down tight. All right, so we'll get to the specific application process in a moment, but let's talk about how to find candidates because it's not about posting it up and then just sitting back and waiting for it to happen. Part of that is getting involved in the community and finding out who's out there and who's looking and helping them nurture and grow so they can be prepared for roles that you're trying to fill. Yeah, posting online is a part getting advertising out there, working with your marketing team for that social media exposure, putting it on NetSec, on Reddit, and so forth. It gets the word out and gets other people knowing that, hey, these roles are out there, okay? There's those boutique recruiters, like I'll mention my friends at Ninja Jobs. There's the meet.com forums. Getting involved in the community and mentioning it, pretty much any tech meeting that I have gone to over the years, any of the good ones have had, hey, is anybody hiring and is anybody looking for a new gig? In the meeting program. Because there is horribly bad outreach. Where I get a span, let's see, four emails in a uh, three minute time frame of here, come apply to us. To me, that's phishing. I'm just going to, you know, report that as spam. Then there's also the bad targeting you need to be aware of. So, yeah, I can go be a technician at AT&T and help pipe everything to certain three letter agencies. Awesome, because that's what I want to do. So as a hiring manager, what is your role? What is our role in talent? We're supposed to be a leader 
in information security, leader in our profession. Notice I didn't say thought leader. We're supposed to be helping nurture and t talent in our field. Okay, your involvement in these groups help promote and help screen potential candidates and also help that community grow and thrive. If you want this talent, sitting around and saying there's nobody to hire is not the right answer. We need to work for it. We need to stop decrying this so-called shortage as out of our hands and help grow it, right? More than that lack of talented technical staff or lack of will at upper management above us, it's a gap with us and in middle management, okay? We do the staffing, we actually go out and spend budget, we implement those tools, we ensure the best, well, we try to ensure the best practices for everything. When there's a failure where we're at, then the whole thing falls apart and it's just, again, another endless cycle. Because it's getting pretty serious, right? Dude. So we alluded to a little bit technical, uh, excuse me, a little bit in regards to recruiters earlier. There is the internal company. Then we talked about the agencies, boutiques, and otherwise, and then the body shops, right? Are those body shops really trying to find unique talent for you? Are they the same folks that already applied to the role? How many times have you as an applicant applied to something a month ago and then got a phone call from some recruiter going, yeah, we're like, we thought your profile would be great for this role. Yeah, why don't you talk to the recruiter and internal HR and ask them why they haven't called them yet. Is your internal recruiter a roadblock or are they helping you attract talent? Right? Along with your application tracking system, your HR, that recruiter, is that first face of your company. You need to make sure that they're setting the tone for the process, ensure that they're good ones, and setting up the expectations for what's happening, what's going on. Because, you know, are they helping source? Are they just screening? Are they not doing any help with you at all? Are they making the whole impression of the process horrible so that that word gets around and makes it even harder for you to attract people to apply? Right? You have them, HR folks, demanding for current and past salary history. Faux pas, and also in some states now illegal. Do they send a screening questionnaire instead of having a screening call, expecting you to do you know short answer essays to even get through this bottleneck? It's that poor experience. As a candidate, we're going to go elsewhere because there's that return on investment. What's that ROI that I have to jump through to even talk to you as the hiring manager to try to get this job? Some ways to improve this. I have found it very useful. One, have the recruiter join you in interviews. Just the initial ones, just so they get a perspective on what's going on. Have your recruiter review some of the uh, take-home assignments if you do that in your process. Have someone from HR on your incident response team. Wow, wait a minute. Because inevitably at some point you're gonna have an incident that involves PII, NPPI, some sort of info sensitive information, their feedback's gonna be valuable in that place and their exposure to all the other things we have to do also feeds back to this. So when you're looking at those external recruiters, just like a potential company that you wanna work for, do that same sort of uh, relationship building and that sort of vetting. Look out for the particular frauds and scams because they're out there. Um, there is a uh, blog post, I'll specifically call it out here why true recruiters are actually super unicorns, which goes into depth on this and what things you should look for and why. So now that we have people all trying to apply, there's multiple different application tracking systems or ATSs in the HR world that they talk about. There's the heavyweight ones that supposedly do all the magic and will match you with the perfect candidate by their data mining of keywords and application management and blah, 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 right? Kind of like UBA. There's the also the lightweight application tracking that kind of just keeps logs of who applied and where they're at in the process. And then fundamentally there's you, the human hiring manager, doing it manually via email and spreadsheet. Each of these have pros and cons from an application applicant and from a manager perspective. Overall, again, the question comes down to what's the return on investment that you're dealing with? Are you getting your money's worth? So when you talk basic email ATS, right? It's quick and easy to apply for the candidate. It's real easy to get lost. 
So as a hiring manager, I strongly urge you to set up some sort of tracking spreadsheet, right? Subject lines and attachment files are very important. So certainly as applicants, make sure you highlight what job you're applying to and your name and why. Don't just send a file name with resume. So as a hiring manager, we understand some folks might have missed out, not taken quite precautions, so try to help them out a little bit and change the file name to who the person is and what the application was for the role. There's some major ATS fails. And again, this goes back to that first impression of your company, not just your website, but also who do you have this outsourced to? So this is part of your risk management program with your external vendors, right? What about that ATS system that's demanding references before you talk with anybody? Since we're all supposed to be security professionals and privacy professionals, why are you demanding I give up sensitive info, right? Especially when they're demanding social security numbers like brass ring. Good app, uh, approach to this is I have friends of mine apply for my job and do they get through the process and what was the experience and have them feed it back to me so I can try to fix it, right? One of the things I also try to do is I test and validate my own promotion efforts and I have my recruiter pass me every resume with their thoughts. That way I can try to track where people are getting applying to. So I know that that blog post that or the post that I made on NetSec is working really well. The uh, post that I made on the SANS D-Shield job list, maybe not the same uh, good number of applicants, but the quality and the things I'm looking for is a higher ratio. And we need to avoid those common application fails because that initial impression lasts. So when you're asking for PII and NPPI, at least have HTTPS configured appropriately. Have the certificates fixed correctly because I'm going to get curious and I'm going to submit it to SSL Labs and laugh at you while I'm drinking a beer, right? It's a little stuff that gives you that bad impression. And we know that the system that you outsource this to, you had no control over the user IDs that's being created or that the passwords are being created or just the horrible bad UX and UI that's logging into the HR system for me, even though I'm getting an error message saying you don't really need to do this, is not you, your company, I hope not. But as a candidate applying to this job, I know right away I have one big problem I'm gonna to have to try to fix when I get this job. Do I wanna fight that battle? You're just helping people pen test the, the, this vendor, really. And then it comes down to the application itself and the questions. And are they relevant to this role and your company and the culture that you have? And I call this the badass owl. Because there are going to be folks, like Tyler here, that goes, F this, close, move on. What's the return on investment? Because I, as an introvert, as an analyst, as an analytical type person, I'm going to sit there for three hours trying to figure out what's the answer that you want. The security vendor that had in their, their questionnaire, give me the URL of a badass owl. How's that even relevant? Other than, oh, so we only let the certain people we want to apply know which badass owl they're looking for? Hmm, okay. This is that first impression we're giving to people. These are those judgments that because we don't have enough information, we don't have enough analysis, we're gonna come up with a hypothesis that you as the hiring manager, you as HR and recruiters are somebody I probably don't wanna work with and I'm gonna move on. So use the ATS, work with your recruiter. It takes time and painful at times, but it's gonna be worthwhile in the long run because they have a better understanding of what you're looking for and why. giving them frank feedback on why this candidate was good or bad or whatnot, and intangible means helps them potentially source better people too, okay? Invite them to your tra team training events. Invite them to your brown bags. The, the amount 
have them sit with you when you take a forensic image and just learn the process and why you do those things. So appreciative that you're willing to take the effort and how much effort are they gonna be able to give back to you because you showed that. And when you get those ap applications, right, are they even interested or are they just spanning a resume everywhere? Can they learn that topics and the technology that, are, that they don't have listed, right? Do they have the security clearance yes, listed? Is there any interesting tidbits in the file metadata? And did they submit a cover letter, right? Are they covering topics that aren't in the resume but potentially interest you as the hiring manager and why they want the job? And if they are listing the security clearance on their resume, is that someone you really want to hire? Here's something that doesn't belong in the resume, shouldn't be in your social media profiles. They actually signed paperwork not to post those things, but yet they are. And DSS does not look kindly on this. And if your HR is pestering folks for that inform information, there's a proper procedure for doing that and we need to get them up to speed. Because HR should know that and they should be able to handle it without questioning our integrity as an applicant. And if that answer is not satisfactory, me as an applicant, am I gonna wanna work for you? Am I gonna wanna continue this process? Along with, you need to worry about people attacking you or tracking you via those resumes they submitted. So having a conversation with that vendor and if they're doing at least any basic AV scanning or sandboxing is gonna be key. I have had folks with, uh, associated with, let's say, nation state try to attack me in this manner. And then there was also the folks that, trying to be funny, did the fake ransomware pop up when you opened up the resume. Thanks, man. Let me go clean up my pants now. So, the interview. I thought this picture was a better one than any of the ones I found from the movie called The Interview, so we'll go with it. Because the interview process is hard. We talked about earlier about we're weird shits that do weird things, and now you're gonna make a bunch of us that are introverts try to be extroverts to get that dream job. And this is a little anxiety inducing. You know, we as hiring managers, we're trying to get a better understanding of this candidate and who they are as a person and how do they interact, but yet we're gonna put them through a grill. Well, as a candidate, am I expected to be through that grill every day I work for you? How does this relate to the normal day-to-day -day of your organization? How can we make this less awful? Because it doesn't need to be. Part of that is as a hiring manager, how do we consider who, you, who do you want and who do you need to interview those candidates? Do those individuals understand their areas of expertise that you want them to talk about and what questions and how, right? I don't and have loved those interviews where clearly that person had no clue about this particular role, but we wanted them to interview anyway. So they're going to come up with some just crazy obtuse question out of the RFC and then chastise you because you didn't know the answer. How is that relevant to your day-to-day -day operations? Understand that when we're having these conversations that are gonna be places where these folks have worked in, play, in environments that are covered by security clearances, non-disclosure agreements, and there's certain things that we can't talk about or that we will try to talk around that's not a reason to yell and berate them that you're not, they're not answering your question. They might not be able to. In legal means, not because they can't, right? These series of questions, the conversations you're having should reflect those requirements of that position description, which should reflect the daily duties of the role as you ex understand it at this time, right? Let's eliminate those juvenile and those pointless interview questions. Let's look at those key areas, what things you're gonna talk about, ask about, and how does that line up with that position description and the areas you're gonna work with. And certainly timing and travel. Again, those initial impressions. So far, I've had a horrible ATS system to try to answer every question in. I've had a horrible experience with your recruiter. Uh, the phone screen with you was okay. I'll keep going through this. And then, you know, I can hear all the noise in the background because you took it at your desk instead of getting a little quiet room, right? 
you invited me to go to lunch, or excuse me, you invited me to come to your site over lunch break, but don't provide me lunch. Or even better, ask what lunch I want and then never provide it. You know, it's that showing of respect. And you're expecting that as a hiring manager from the folks that you work with. You know, you have to earn it to be able to give it back, right? Or receive it back as well. Prefer, prepare for your interview, for your review, because they're hopefully doing the same thing. What does Glassdoor, Indeed, et cetera, what does the feedback on your particular company and you, potentially your team and have answers, hopefully truthful ones, for when they quiz you? Because this is an, it should be an interview on both sides. And if they don't ask about those things, that might be something you as a hiring manager want to note because it is about ethics. We need to balance in creating this inter these interviews between the fact-based versus the essay short, right? Figure out who asked what and potentially, do you have any questions that are duplicated or not, right? Or you wanna focus in on a specific area and see how they answer it? Or is there a question that you didn't think you got, they got right, which you want them to try again, okay? Yes, there's a ton of question lists find, found online. Don't go through them verbatim. The number of times I've dinged, I've, uh, I've called out a recruiter call, is like, I know exactly what page you got that from, and the next question is this. We need to be real in these job in interviews because these are real projects, these are real problems that our team is struggling with. A lot of hiring managers, a lot of companies will harp on doing the puzzles, doing a packet capture exercise, right? Here's this hack site, and if you can get through it, then you can go and apply for a job. Okay, this is a good way to see a candidate's attention to detail, their report writing, their technical research abilities. I would do this after an initial interview, after a phone screen, even potentially after an in-person. What's that return on investment again for that candidate to accomplish? Because we're basically trying to get them to do free work. How is that exercise relating to your operations, to the tools you have, to the work that they're going to be doing for this role? Or is this really cool mind test exercise to see if they're cool as we are? How's that reflective of your team and your business environment? Are you scaring people away? Because clearly there's nobody to hire, right? because clearly there's nobody to hire because we needed to keep pulling these stump the monkey questions because they're not fun for everybody. These are those trick questions, those Google stumpers. They don't have anything to do with the job or anything, right? This does not, these questions don't convey how good of an analyst, an engineer, how good of a hacker that they are or that they could be. Our objective should be to assess how does this candidate process information? How do they figure out how to address that threat risk vulnerability, not how fast they can recite DNS as port 53. Because if you're going to be jerks with those sort of questions, that candidate's going to make assumptions and go elsewhere. But yet there's nobody to hire. They can't get through our strict process. These are these lasting impressions on you and as a company. Right? Sometimes there is more than one answer, Google, and how you do something different experiences, different environments, right? We need to build that relationship with you and the candidate and the very things that we want, rather, that we need, and keeping a, a good mind on Wheaton's Law through all this. It reverberates. We talk. We come to conferences like this going, yeah, I applied at blah, 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 and they were freaking horrible. We need to worry and keep an eye on when we're doing, putting this together on that question bias, right? So what if the candidate does not know how to work with Palo Altos? Can they learn to work with it? Right? How have you worked with Qualys? Right? InfoSec's more than a tool equals problem. At least it should be. 
we need to use those situational exploratory conversations, right? What's some of the ways that you use Palo Alto firewalls to address the vulnerabilities and attacks in your environment? And let them talk. Not, have you ever used Cisco? Yes. Firewall, I have at home. No. Right? So I'm making these references to types of wood because there's an excellent blog post in regards to if carpenters were hired like programmers, just cross out programmers and put in security professional. It's the same thing. Or related at least, right? We need to stop passing judgment. We need to, as hiring managers, we need to keep our bias in check, right? See back to Wheaton's Law. People get nervous and forget things. Okay, how will they figure it out? We have the portable knowledge store right here. I can figure this out. Okay, fine. Google is down. Now how will you figure it out? What's your pro troubleshooting? What's your process of elimination, right? Again, a TED Talk I would reference called Evaluate the Scrapper. And uh, for whatever feelings you might have on TED Talks, this is actually a pretty decent one. From an HR person, no less, and a recruiter, in how if you looked at her resume, you would never hire her. When in fact, because of her resume and her background and experiences, she's able to bring all those things to the table and bring a broader perspective to the team. And let's talk about time and a role when we're going through these resumes. Why does that matter? So many things are out of the candidate's control, but yet we're going to hold them to it. Why is this concern of job hopping? Okay, This notion of lifetime employment is antiquated and false, flat out. There is what's being called the tour of duty employment for the length of time. And it just, their people aren't getting hired to work at places for 10 and 20 years anymore, folks. And unfortunately, and as much as that sucks, this isn't big blue IBM anymore. We need to put ourselves in their place, adjust our paradigms and adjust our expectations back to what we were talking about with Wynn and folks earlier, okay? Because just because they were unemployed doesn't mean they're untouchable. We need to put our bias aside, no matter what a certain security podcast says. We need to listen to their reason or reasons and don't assume their excuses, right? Is this potentially discrimination if we're not even accepting people, not even going to talk to them because they're unemployed right now? Again, we need to put ourselves in their place. We're all humans. Because not all gaps should be a bad reflection on the candidate, right? There could have been school, personal development, impacts with the recession, layoffs, personal time. You just needed a morning period of sabbatical because you needed that previous job so bad or it was such a hellhole. You needed some, I needed my some me time. And that's a good thing in the security community because so much of us keep trudging on and fighting through and then we burn out. There's two things I specifically look for, and then when people hiring managers talk to me, what I should look for, Tim, this is the first one. Can they answer this question? And can they answer this question from a technical standpoint and from a non-technical standpoint and also from a C-level standpoint, right? How do you reduce risk? How can you, what is a vulnerability? What is a threat? What's an asset? What's that cost involved with it all? We all understand we need to take care of all vulnerabilities, right? Well, from a business environment, it's a little bit more granular than that, okay? Along with that, I call the trifecta. Does this person have the ability and want and desire to learn? And are they doing this on their own as well? Do they have that, do they have a passion about anything? Learning, figuring things out, solving those problems, and do they have the ability to be wrong, to fail, and to do so well and learn from it? Because we're all going to fail. We're human. Or are we going to throw my coworkers underneath the bus? All right. So we reviewed a bunch of people. We've had them through the interviews. What's some of those common excuses? Oh, not technical enough. Oh, not a cultural fit. These arbitrary, just really vague terms that we can't quantify. 
Well, part of this whole thing that we were talking about is having the right questions that for each people to ask, right? Then have that individual give a scoring system and average those scores to help and eliminate that bias that you're getting. We need to stop using culture fit as a crutch, right? Because we're supposed to be hiring people for aptitude. Can they do it? Can they learn to do it? And can they be an asset to your team, right? And do they also provide some diversity for our team? Because the recruiters actually have a name for this that we're looking for that such unique person that it's the purple squirrel that you will never find it. And if it's even more unique, they call it the plaid unicorn. Mind you, this plaid unicorn is so unique, the only image I could find of a plaid unicorn was from Etsy. That's the only one out there on the internets. Internets, you need to take care of this. Some folks are introverted. Some are extroverted. Some roles align to one of those other t personality types. Diversity is a good thing in our culture, gender, nature, and perspective because we all bring something, a different perspective to the table in how do we defeat this bad guy? What's the different mitigation that we can do for this particular vulnerability, right? Used effectively. That can be a godsend in finding those bad actors, working with the business, and building those rapport with the different business units within your organization. It's helping avoid that groupthink, which so many of us in teams have fallen into. Part of this is trying to find that within the hiring process, right? You're also looking at with these candidates that social interactions. And are you, as a hiring manager, and our recruiters, and the other people in the hiring team, in the interview team, are, they a, are you able to sell the role and the team in the company, right? It's not just the candidate selling it to you, it's the other way around as well. Are they really interested in the product that you're selling, in the, your company, in your team, and what the mission that you're trying to do? If they don't know that question, are they able to figure it out? And yes, is Google down? I love that one. Uh, Google's never down. Bullshit, right? It's been down. But what's the question really is, how do you troubleshoot something? I went to go find information, I couldn't find it, so I'm gonna go somewhere else. Where is that? Do they call out your interviewers regarding inappropriate questions in an appropriate way? Do they ask questions? And do they ask anything other than what's found online, right? I also like to check manners with everyone that they've interacted with. My front desk person, the security guard, whoever. Because how do we treat other humans, right? That gives me an insight in how are they going to be treating you and the rest of the team. What's that full picture? What sort of information can I find because this guy decided to put full lifestyle poly on everything and now I exactly know what three-letter agency this person works for. If they're that vocal about this sort of thing, how vocal are they going to be about your intellectual property? That's the question. Are they qualified or can they be, right? Can they learn those tasks? Can they learn that tool? Can they answer that question? Do they have that trifecta? And it's not the ATS system or HR to determine if the candidate is qualified. It's you as the hiring manager and your team. Now it's closing the deal. Hey, we found hopefully at least one, at least one primary, let's give them an offer, right? But we can't seem to find that balance between being aloof about not being able to give them the job and botching the opportunity to provide the offer. And then we have candidates that are acting like overly attached girlfriend trying to get any sort of feedback. How did, you know, I really want to work with you guys. We, we don't leave people hanging. Send an email or a call with a status update, right? Provide some feedback, of course, if HR or legal will allow. If not, then circle back at a later date. The conversations that I've had even six months to a year later with candidates or folks that I had interviewed with have been a godsend on both sides and also helped build that rapport within the community, right? 
helps improve that pool of candidates. If people aren't understanding the what and why, how can I do better if I don't know? That there was glaring resume issues or there was some cruft in the metadata on the document, right? Get feedback from them when you're able to provide feedback on your process and how they did like it or didn't like it. Because again, if you don't know something was a bother, something was a roadblock, how can you address it? Did they send you a thank you note or an email? Or are they trying to add you on every social media platform out there? To me, creepy. Give me, give me a minute, right? Did they leave feedback on Glassdoor, right? I recommend, you know, certainly the candidates, ladies, don't sell yourself short. Managers, don't be a cheapskate. If you're advertising this role nationwide, you best be paying nationwide rates. Not just because it's cheaper to live out here in BFE, doesn't mean you're gonna give it, should give them a pay cut. Oh, but this is such a nice place to raise a family. I don't want the excuses, so make it up in other ways. We talked about earlier, right? Some extra PTO, with some training budget, gear for the home lab, work remote, et cetera. There's plenty of other ways to try to make this a well-rounded package. And also, don't bait and switch. You have an agreed upon salary, title, position, and then when the title of the offer arrives, it's something different. Way to get a black eye in the community, because that gets around. And lastly, there's those perspective and expectations, because it's not just about getting him hired and in the door, it's how can we make this better? How can we peak perspective, right? We're implementing those policies set forth by the C-suite. We're that front line of defense. We need to try to balance that hard technical of our tools with the soft technical of the human interactions. And this is a long game. If we're not doing this well, which is probably part of the reason why we're looking to hire somebody in the first place because the last person left, care and nurture of the team brings better performance out of our team and better professionals and hopefully better humans, right? And there's plenty of talks about out there right now about imposter syndrome, managing up the mental health and burnout. And I had a bunch of slides on that, but with the time limitations, I've cut them out. We're happy to talk with you guys about that after you were on. There's a mass, when that mass exodus of that security team happens, it's not just because, well, Tim left and now everybody's leaving. There's really, there's some previous event or series of events that was a catalyst for everyone to start looking at the same time. That makes it even harder to attract and retain the talent because everybody's seeing that everybody just left their team. We need to be a leader. Hey, this is a common theme for us, right? We need to address those I issues early because our leadership, our management directly relates to that team culture and that high ability to hire folks. We need to think outside the box. We talked about diversity, interns is great in that long-term pipeline and also nurturing that younger community and getting people involved with their team. Don't eliminate out just the two-year schools. A lot of them have InfoSec programs now and are not that bad. They're actually pretty technical. And also look at veterans. Many of the veterans have technical and InfoSec backgrounds now and have an interest and a need for it. They just need some help uh, acclimating to the real world, if you want to. And then helping those communities and teaching those communities, right? Because these are long-term fixes. We need to look at how do we fix this? There's not going to be a recruiting company out there anywhere that can fix this, even though they're trying to say that they can, right? Also, how could and how should applicants socially engineer these situations to you in their favor, right? Because my friend Kat puts it so well, these impressions that we give to applicants and employees, past and present, they influence the bottom line, our reputation and business dev development in ways that we can't even measure. So, one of the things I'll talk with in the uh, 
conference staff. I have a basically a homework assignment for the different blogs and, and videos to go and watch to get some more uh, understanding and interest in the different things I referred to in this talk. Okay, going back. So we talked about Win, kind of a couple of blog posts, the TED Talk, and Mallory has a great post about the only imposter in InfoSec. We need to set and adjust our expectations. If I go to the Tesla dealership, yeah, right. How many color? How many colors do they have for your car? Right. So if we're putting out a position description, how? What is that plaid unicorn we're trying to find? Or are we a bit more realistic to what the pool is out there, and then helping them learn those other pieces they don't know? So some takeaways. Here's some things that I have found helpful in taking this next step, right? Talk to the rest of us here. Talk to two other people post-conference on how does their application and selection process work or not and try to do better. Figure out how you can be more active and involved with your local community. How do you mentor the younger or less experienced in the field? Right? How can you improve your own application process, your own screening process? Have you done that pen test or had somebody do it for you? And review those possible social engineering approaches to this process and determine what mitigations you might need to implement. But Tim, none of this is technical. Social engineering is not technical. Then why do we keep screwing this up? Right? But this is stuff everybody knows, right? then why do we keep messing it up? And yeah, that was a lot of sides. That's my presentation style, I apologize. So thank you to all the individuals that are out there talking about this and pu publishing, publishing thoughts about this and trying to help us as a community improve this versus the whining about there's nobody to hire, right? Helping help perpetuate the things we can do to improve this, right? And also thanks to those that have submitted to the jobs we've posted, and those folks we interviewed with, and um, those that we have interviewed with. Thank you very much. Any questions? Back corner, please. Ah, uh, yes. So the question was about companies that have them have candidates take the personality tests. Myers Briggs, etc. I've done a little bit of research into this area. It seems to be a whole lot of quackery. Um, there is. Let me look here. I don't think I, I didn't put it on the reference. So when I provide to the conference folks a list of references. Um, there's also a couple other sources. One of those is a uh, HR recruiter for many years who has a blog series and to, goes deep into this and into the quackery. And for like Pastu science, it's kind of interesting. You know, I've taken it and you know, I'm a INTJ or whatever it is. And okay, that's helpful for me to get a little bit of an understanding of myself and how I can improve myself. But using that as a hard and fast data point on to how do you hire somebody? I don't know. That, that, that just seems wrong to me. Okay. Oh, so the, the comment with that was, so you as the hiring manager, HR doesn't even give you the results of the tests. So why are you as a company even wasting the money? Yeah. So there, there is some, um, not so much in the security space, but in the hiring bubble of folks that are talking about this, there's plenty of feedback and discussions in this space. Um, you can hit me up after, I can get you the right source to that, and then you can provide that with your HR folks to have some serious conversations about what's that return on investment. And yeah, I, I've had places where I applied to, and their first step was, take this test. Again, what's that return on investment? What's the ROI of me spending an hour asking, you know, do you like blue hair or green hair? Or whatever, the, you know, just, 
what's the next word that comes in sequence? I'm just going to skip that because I can go and apply to five or ten other jobs in that same time frame and probably at least get one phone call from it. Any other questions? Sir. So, yes, um, doing this process takes a lot of work and a lot of effort. And myself as a hiring manager, I'll spend nights and weekends going through resumes because I want to spend the time doing it. They're interesting enough, there was a uh, recent thread on Reddit where there was a hiring manager whining that it takes too much time and I'm only going to interview three people. That tells me that's a hiring manager I would never want to work for, right? because they're not helping contribute back to solving this issue. So asking for assistance, one of the things, that's part of what we talk, I was talking about here with how do you going to have that hiring process, right? Do you want to have somebody, uh, a junior analyst or a senior analyst, do your initial screening first? That really gets into what's the culture of your team like? How can you spread the duties out to help everybody learn and grow from all this and help the uh, candidates learn from the experience as well? Certainly, part of being a hiring manager and being a leader in this community is knowing when to say one and also knowing when to ask for help, which for some of us is very hard to do. So, hope that answers your question. Anybody else would love to talk to folks uh, after this outside if you'd care to. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the conference.